Batman. Written by Ian Miller. Based on a screenplay by Sam Hamm and Warren Scarf. Gotham City was once a city of tomorrow, filled with possibilities. Now, it's a crime-filled, almost gothic city. Corruption around every corner. Danger in the shadows. That was until something else came out of the shadows. A small family touring Gotham had decided it was time to return to their hotel. After finding it difficult to get a cab in the busy city, the father, Harold, looked at his wife. We'll never get a cab. Let's get over to Seventh. We're going the wrong way. Seventh is that way. Son, I know where we are. The father led his family from the main street into a nearby alley. A homeless man held out his hand, hoping Harold would give him some money. Harold walked his family past the homeless man and further into the alley. Without warning, someone hit Harold in the back of the head, and he slumped to the ground, unconscious. Harold. A man emerged from the shadows with a gun in his hand. The mother and her son heard footsteps and saw the homeless man pull out a gun from his coat pocket. Do the kid a favor, lady. Don't scream. The one who had hit Harold grabbed his wallet. Then the two men ran out of the alley and disappeared. On a rooftop nearby, the two men went through the stolen wallet. What we get? All right, the guy was loaded. Let's beat, man. I don't like it up here. After what happened to Johnny Gobbs? Look, Johnny Gobbs got ripped off, I. Right? No big loss. That ain't what I heard at all. I heard the bat got him. The bat? Give me a break. There ain't no bat. Suddenly, both men heard something move on the gravel, as if someone else was on the roof with them. The sound came from the opposite corner of the roof. That's when they saw him. The figure raised his arms, but in their minds, they weren't arms. They were bat wings. He was in all black and had pointed ears. On his chest was the emblem of a bat embedded onto his armored suit. The figure moved closer to his prey. Mick pulled out his gun and fired twice. The figure crashed against the gravel, not moving. Both Mick and Eddie turned to run but suddenly stopped in their tracks. They turn back slowly. The figure is on his feet, spreading his wings once more. In a swift movement, he kicked Eddie in the stomach, sending him crashing into the wall, unconscious. Nick tried to make a run for it, but the figure was faster. He punched Nick in the face and he almost fell off the ledge. The figure grabbed him and brought the hoodlum close to his face. Don't kill me! Don't kill me, man! Don't kill me! I'm not gonna kill you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. Who are you? I'm Batman. Batman threw the thug down onto the ground. He turned, spread his cape, and jumped off the ledge. Nick crawled over to the ledge and looked down. All he saw was the empty alley. Batman was gone. In an upscale apartment, gangster Jack Napier and Alicia Hunt watched the latest news report. District Attorney Harvey Dent promises to wage war on crime boss Carl Grissom and make our city safe for decent people. A lot of decent people shouldn't live here. They'd be happier someplace else. 
Alicia was actually Carl Grissom's girlfriend and was worried about Carl finding out that she was seeing Jack. Pretty tough talk about Carl. Don't worry about it, Alicia. If this clown could touch Grissom, I'd have killed him by now. If Grissom knew about us, he might kill you. Don't flatter yourself, Angel. He can't run this city without me. Besides, he doesn't know. Later that night, Gotham Globe reporter Alexander Knox arrived at the alleyway, which had a lot of police activity. He saw someone on a stretcher being put into an ambulance and another man in handcuffs. When Knox spotted the person he wanted to speak to, he walked past the ambulance. Lieutenant Echo, what's going on? Nothing, Knox. These two guys slipped on a banana peel. I think you're not telling me everything, Lieutenant. I bet those guys saw a supernatural form in the shape of a bat. That's eight sightings in a month. Don't write this stuff in your paper. It'll ruin your useless reputation. Every punk in this town is scared stiff. They say he can't be killed. I've heard enough. Lieutenant, is there a six-foot bat in Gotham City? If so, is he on the police payroll? If so, what's he pulling down after taxes? With that, Eckhart turned and walked away. He started to head for his car when he saw a stretch limo across the street. Leaning against the vehicle was Jack Napier. Eckhart then approached the limo. If it isn't our pet police lieutenant. Whatever you're selling, I ain't buying. I answer to Grissom not to psychos. Why, officer, you should be thinking about the future. You mean when you run the show? You got no future, Jack. You're nuts, and Grissom knows it. Swiftly, Napier pushed Eckhart against a wall. Just as fast, the corrupt cop pulled out his gun and pointed it at the gangster. Napier loosened his grip on Eckhart and gave him a little smile. Watch the suit. <laughs> then, he walked back to the limo and got in. Eckhart watched as the vehicle drove off. Where have you been spending the nights, Jack? The next day at the Gotham Globe, Alexander Knox was writing up the previous night's events when a co-worker called his name. Hey Knox, there's someone here to see you. Knox looked up and saw a beautiful blonde woman approaching him. Hi, I'm Vicki Vale. The photographer, right? Vogue, Cosmo, I've seen your stuff. Actually, I've been in the Corto Maltese war zone. She showed Knox photos of the war zone. He was very impressed by her work. What are you doing here? I'm here to see some of the wildlife in Gotham City. Like what? Like bats. A picture of a guy in a bat suit catching criminals. Batman sweeps crime from Gotham. My photos, your words, Pulitzer Prize material. Right now, you're the only one that believes me. I need proof. Commissioner Gordon has a file, but I can't reach him. He'll be at Bruce Wayne's charity party, won't he? I'm not on the guest list. Vicky pulled out two tickets to the charity party and showed them to Knox. I am. Miss Vale, got a date? In a Gotham penthouse later that night, crime boss Carl Grissom slams a newspaper on his desk. On the front page is a picture of District Attorney Harvey Dent. The headline read, Harvey Dent cracks down on crime bosses. Pulling himself together, he turns his attention to Jack Napier, who was playing with his lucky deck of cards. I want you to handle the operation at Access Chemical personally, Jack. Me? Carl, maybe we should get someone else to do it. The fumes in that place. Jack. 
It's an important job. If the DA gets his hands on our record books, we're finished. I need someone I can trust. Jack pulled up another playing card and frowned. It was a joker. He got up and looked at Grissom. Okay. I'll handle it. With your luck, it should be easy. With that, Napier put on his hat and coat and left. My friend, your luck is about to change. I need to thank Lieutenant Eckert for telling me about Jack and Alicia. The charity benefit at Wayne Manor was in full swing. Most of Gotham's socialites were there. Alexander Knox and Vicki Vale skimmed the large living room to see who had made it to the party. The mayor was talking to Harvey Dent over at a craps table. That was when Knox had spotted police commissioner, James Gordon, also at the craps table. He and Vicki walked over. Good evening, Commissioner Gordon. Alexander Knox, and this is Vicki Vale. We're both from Gotham Globe. I heard a crazy rumor that you've opened a file on the Batman. Is that true, Commissioner? There is no bat. If there were, we would find him. We would arrest him. That's what I always hear, Commissioner. Come on, be straight with me. Please, Mr. Knox, enjoy the party. Go look at Wayne's weapons collection or something. Vicky led Knox to a large room that was filled with rows with a wide array of warrior armor from different countries and time periods. Look at this stuff. Who is this guy, Wayne? He gives to humanitarian causes and collects all this. Vicky looked at one armor in particular. Where'd this come from? It's Japanese. They turned to see the smiling face of Bruce Wayne. Knox reached out and shook the billionaire's hand. So you're Bruce Wayne? Alexander Knox? Of the Globe? I read your work. I like it. And I'm Vicky Vale. I've seen your photographs. You've got an extraordinary eye. Some people think she has too. <laughs> this is an amazing house. Before Vicky could finish her thought, an older man came into the room. This was Bruce Wayne's butler. Alfred Pennyworth. So, Commissioner Gordon was compelled to leave. Thank you, Alfred. Very unexpectedly, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you, Alfred. Uh, will you excuse me? Sure. With that, Bruce and Alfred left, leaving Knox and Vicky looking at the huge mirror in the room. What they didn't know was that behind the mirror was a camera recording them. Below the manor was a bat cave. In the cave was a whole bank of computer monitors. Bruce sat in front of the monitors and watched Alexander Knox and Vicky Vale for another moment before turning his attention to the camera footage that he needed to see. It was footage of Commissioner Gordon talking to one of his officers. Just got an anonymous tip. Jack Napier is cleaning out Axe's chemicals. Good lord. If we could get our hands on him, we'd have Grissom. Bruce loosened his tie and walked towards the vault where a suit was waiting for him. It was a bat suit. Bruce Wayne was Batman. Outside of Axis Chemicals, a group of police officers, led by Lieutenant Eckhart, we're getting ready to go into the plant after Jack Napier. Inside, Napier's thugs were going through the filing cabinets, while Napier watched as a safecracker was working on the office safe with a blowtorch. The safecracker turned off the blowtorch and opened the safe. It was empty. Napier realized he was set up by his boss, Grissom. He motioned to his men that it was time to leave, but before they could move, 
a police officer pointed his gun at them from a nearby catwalk. Hey, freeze! One of Napier's thugs fired his gun at the police officer. In the confusion, Napier decided to make a run for it. Not too far away, Eckhart ordered his men on his bullhorn when he saw Gordon and two other officers coming his way. What's going on here? This is my car. Beat it. I'm in charge here, not Kyle Grissom. Gordon grabbed the bullhorn out of Eckhart's hand. This is Commissioner Gordon. I want him taken alive. I repeat, any man who opens fire on Jack Napier will answer to me. Up above on one of the catwalks, Napier and one of his men were looking for a way out when something caught their attention. On the opposite catwalk, Batman jumped down. The hoodlum leveled his gun and fired at the cape figure, but Batman pulled out his miniature spear gun. He pointed it at the thug and fired. A barbed hook caught the side of the man's coat and with a sharp pull from Batman's line, he fell over the railing. Batman tied the line to the railing so the hoodlum wouldn't fall. From down below, Gordon looked up and saw Batman running along the catwalk. Oh my gosh. Unseen, Napier was on another catwalk looking down and pointed his gun at Eckhart. Napier fired. To his dismay, he only wounded the cop. Suddenly, Napier realized he wasn't alone on the catwalk. Behind him was Batman. In a swift movement, Napier turned and pointed his weapon at his new prey, and smiled. Why so serious? Napier pulled the trigger. Batman pulled up his arm and the bullet ricocheted off of his gauntlet. The bullet hit Napier in his cheek and fell over the catwalk railing. At the last second, he grabbed the railing. Batman reached for his hand, but Napier's grip on the railing slipped, and he fell into a vat of chemicals below. Gordon and two officers climbed up the catwalk, guns pointed at Batman. Hold it right there. As Batman raised his hands, he threw two smoke capsules, which exploded on impact. Smoke filled the catwalk. Using the distraction, Batman fired his grapnel gun at an open skylight window and propelled himself upward. The smoke cleared and Gordon saw Batman was gone. An officer approached Gordon. Who's this guy? I don't know. And until we can find out, keep a lid on it. Down by the chemical sluice outside of Axis Chemicals, playing cards started floating to the surface. Suddenly, a bone-white hand broke the surface. Jack Napier was still alive. The next night, Vicki Vale had accepted a dinner invite from Bruce Wayne at Wayne Manor. They were both quite taken by each other. They sat and ate in the dining room at the long table. I'm flattered that you asked me to dinner, Bruce. Could you pass the salt? Sure. Do you like eating in here? Do you know, I don't think I've ever seen this room before in my life. <laughs> After dinner, they walked down the hallway, exploring more of the house. This house? All this stuff? It doesn't seem like you. Some of it's very much me. Some of it isn't. The dining room is definitely not you. <laughs> no, it's not. You're very strange, Mr. Wayne. Thank you. In his penthouse apartment, Carl Grissom was pouring himself a drink when he heard the elevator behind him open. That you, Alicia? Grissom turned to see a man walking slowly towards him. A man who he thought was dead. 
Jack? Thank God you're alive. Mm, I heard you've been- Fried? Is that what you heard? You set me up over a woman. You must be insane. (laughs) Grissom saw the man pull a gun out of his pocket, pointing it at him. Jack, listen, we'll cut a deal. Jack? Jack is dead, my friend. The man removed his hat. You can call me Joker. Grissom was shocked to see that the man in front of him had green hair, white skin, and a red, eerie smile. Joker fired his gun, and Grissom collapsed to the floor. As you can see, I'm much happier. He walked over to his former boss's desk and saw a newspaper with the headline, Wing Freak Terrorizes Gotham Gangland. Watch it, Batman. Wait till they get a load of me. (laughs) At the Gotham Globe, the following day, Vicki Vale started looking through the newspaper's records on Bruce Wayne. Alexander Knox approached her with a look of concern on his face. I'm losing confidence in you, going out with this weirdo. This wouldn't be a personal issue for you, would it? I just want you to do your job. I am doing my job. There's nothing in these records but social puff pieces. No photos, no history, nothing. Who is this guy? Who cares? I do. I'm going to get answers. Later that day, Vicky started following Bruce. She followed him to an alley, which was nicknamed Crime Alley. He laid two red roses on the sidewalk and continued walking. Vicky followed and saw Bruce had joined a crowd that was forming around City Hall. At City Hall, Gotham mobster Vinny Ricorso was telling reporters that Carl Grissom had asked him to take over his business until he returned from a long vacation. His lawyer stood next to him. We have witnesses. It's true. I saw it. I was there. The whole crowd turned to see a mime, walking towards Ricorso. This was no ordinary mime. It was the Joker. He raised his dead hand and signed the paper in his own blood, and he did it with this pen. Joker pulled out a feather pen from his inner coat pocket. The crowd was so focused on him that they didn't notice other mimes surrounding them. Joker looked Recorso in the eye. Hello, Vinny. He threw the pen and it hit Recorso in the throat. He fell to the pavement. Everyone was in shock at what they had just witnessed. Their shock turned to horror as the mimes pulled out machine guns and fired in the air, creating a distraction. The crowd dove for cover, but Vicky was shocked to see that Bruce was the only one still standing. Bruce, get down! Bruce was just fixated on Joker as a car pulled up. Joker and his goons got in the car and drove off. Bruce, you could have been killed. Bruce? I'm sorry, I I have to go. With that, Bruce walked away, leaving Vicky standing there, trying to understand what just happened. At Axis Chemicals, the Joker in his second in command, Bob, were watching a news report on what happened at City Hall. When the news reporter asked the mayor if Batman was a mob enforcer, Joker was angered that the news was talking about a man in a costume. Batman? Batman? Can somebody tell me what kind of a world we live in where a man dressed as a bat gets my airtime? 
He looked back at Bob for a second and then turned his attention back to the news report. When the camera panned to Vicky Vale, Joker's jaw dropped as he was taken back by her beauty. Oh, stop the brass. Who is that? It's Vicky Vale. She's a photographer. Well, that woman has style, lovely woman like that. She's dating some guy named Wayne. She's about to trade up. I'm gonna get me a new girlfriend, Bobby. After all, I need one. It's sad about Alicia. That, uh, accident, isn't it? <laughs> the action news station. The newscasters were in the middle of their report. Good evening. Two more deaths from the mysterious laughing sickness were reported today, bringing the total to 14. The cause of the deaths could be a violent allergic reaction, but authorities have not ruled anything out. Peter? Plans continue for the city's 200th birthday celebration as Mayor Borg announced the unveiling of a new statue of the city's founder. <laughs> Becky? <laughs> Uh, Becky. <laughs> Peter looked as he saw Becky laughing hysterically. He motioned to the director to kill the camera as Becky fell out of her chair, still laughing. The live feed was cut, then replaced by two supermodels with green hair, bone white skin, and red lips, fixed in a frightening grin. Love that Joker. Suddenly, the picture changed and showed the Joker pushing a shopping cart through an aisle of a grocery store. New improved Joker brand with my new secret sauce. Smilex! <laughs> Let's do a blind taste test. The picture changed again to show Joker and a blindfolded producer tied to a chair. Oh, that producer's not happy. He's been using brand X. Pouring a few drops of his Smilex solution into a teaspoon, Joker forced the producer to swallow its contents. The producer's mouth turned into a permanent smile. But with the new improved Joker brand, I get a grin again and again. You'll probably ask, where can I buy these fine products? That's the deal, folks. Chances are you bought them already. <laughs> So, remember, put on a happy face. <laughs> Later that night, Vicki Vale had arrived at the Flugelheim Museum for a date with Bruce Wayne. She waited an hour for Bruce when the waiter came up to her and gave her a small box. She thought it might be a gift from Bruce and opened it. Inside was a small rebreather mask and a card that read, Dear Vicky Vale, put this on, right now. Vicky couldn't understand what was happening and didn't have time to figure it out. Some sort of green gas started seeping out of the air vents. Vicky put on the mask as she saw other patrons collapsing either on the ground or onto their tables. A few minutes later, the gas cleared and the museum's main doors opened. The Joker entered, with a few of his goons following him. Gentlemen, let's broaden our minds. He made his way towards Vicky's table, who was still wearing her mask. I think it's safe to take that mask off now. No, oh, you're beautiful. Thank you. I know you expected that billionaire Wayne, but uh, I hope you won't be disappointed, because I was the one who invited you here. Let me tell you about myself. You see, I do what others dream of. I do art till somebody dies. <laughs> I'm the world's first fully functioning homicidal artist. What do you want? My face on the one dollar bill. 
You must be joking. Do I look like I'm joking? What do you want from me? A little song, a little dance. Batman's head on a lance. Just then, the skylight shattered over their heads and a cape shadow glided to the floor. Joker found himself face to face with Batman. The Cape Crusader grabbed Vicky and pointed his steel gauntlet at the Joker. Batman fired the gauntlet. It split into two, sending two metal spikes on wires, embedding themselves in walls on both sides of the atrium, creating an escape wire. Joker looked in shock as Batman and Vicky swooped past over the goons' heads and straight through the arched doorway. Where does he get those wonderful toys? Outside the museum, Batman threw two smoke bombs back into the entrance, covering their escape. Then, he turned his attention to Vicky. Get in the car. What car? Vicky looked around and saw a black, sleek, futuristic car parked along the side alley. They both ran to it and the Batmobile's door whooshed open. Both of them climbed in. The Batmobile barreled out of the alley and zoomed off into the night. Batman drove down a deserted stretch of road. Vicky tried to look at his face, but he turned on a light behind his head, which made it impossible for her to see him. She looked out through the windshield and saw that they were headed into an enormous cliff wall. Vicky screamed, but to her amazement, the cliff wall vanished altogether. It's not a real stone, Miss Vale. It's a hologram. I'm glad. What is this place? Home. What are you going to do with me? You're going to do something for me. I think I figured out what Joker is doing with these products that are killing people. Batman walked to a lab table. On the table were test tubes, beakers, and dozens of tainted products such as makeup, deodorant, and lipstick. What is all this? The police have got it wrong. They're looking for one product, but the Joker's tainted hundreds of basic chemicals at their source. Then whole shipments of every product would be poison. We'd all be dead. The poison only works when they're mixed. Hairspray won't do it alone, but hairspray mixed with lipstick and perfume will become toxic and untraceable. How did you figure this out? Take this to the press. Why did you bring me here? You could have sent this information. Batman suddenly pulled Vicky close to him and pulled out a sleeping capsule from his utility belt. He pulled the capsule up to Vicky's face and broke it. Gas. I'm sorry. I was wrong to bring you here. The next morning, from his Axis Chemicals hideout, the Joker watched the news report on his television. Avoid the following combinations. Deodorant with baby powder, hairspray, and shampoo. Safe products are flying in as Gotham goes on a forced fast. And all of Gotham is wondering what to make of the Batman, friend, or foe. I've given a name to my pain, and it is Batman. Out of frustration, Joker pointed a gun at the screen and fired. The set exploded. He turned to his right-hand man. Bob, you've got to possess strength to inflict greater pain. We've got a bat to kill, and I want to clean my claws. Later that day, 
Bruce Wayne paid a visit to Vicki Vale's apartment to talk about his recent behavior. I came here to clear a few things up. Who do you think I am? I called you and called you! <laughs> Look, will you give me a chance to explain something? People have different sides to them. A whole other life they have to lead. Vicky, what I'm trying to tell you is that I'm... <clears throat> Before Bruce could finish his thought, the front door burst open, and the Joker entered the apartment, his thugs in tow. Knock, knock. Miss me? Bruce used Joker's entrance and rushed into the living room. He grabbed a silver metal tray that was close by and stuffed it in his inner coat. He turned his attention back to Joker and Vicky. Vicky, I'm really very upset. You were dining with me. I was a man who was getting somewhere with a beautiful woman. And all of a sudden, you take off with that sideshow phony. Joker then noticed that Bruce was in the room with them. Well, Miss Vale, another rooster in the hen house? Take thy beak from out my heart. You're Bruce Wayne, isn't it? I know who you are. Really. Let me tell you about this guy I know, Jack. Bad seed. Coward. Mean. Hurt people. Oh, I like him already. <laughs> Bruce walked over to the fireplace and secretly picked up the fire pick. Problem is, he got crazy. Sloppy. Heads full of bad wiring. You know what happened to that guy? He ended up with his lights out. Bruce then swung the fire pick into the air. You want to go nuts? Come on, let's get nuts. Joker pulled out his gun and pointed it at Bruce. Tell me something, my friend. Have you ever danced with the devil by the pale moonlight? What? Bruce was shocked at what Joker had said, as if he had heard it before, a long time ago. I ask that question of all my prey. I just like the sound of it. Joker pulled the trigger. Bruce collapsed to the floor without a sound. Joker turned his attention back to Vicky and motioned to his goons it was time to leave. Without looking at the late Bruce Wayne, Joker had the last word. Never mess with another man's rhubarb. <laughs> Vicky. Why is it every time we get comfy, there's always someone in the way? I'm only laughing on the outside. My smile is just skin deep. If you could say inside, I'm really crying. You might join me for a week. <laughs> Joker turned and left. Vicky ran back to the living room to see what she could do to help Bruce. But Bruce was already gone. Bruce? She couldn't understand how Bruce was alive until she looked and saw her silver metal tray. Embedded in the tray was a bullet. Later at the Gotham Globe, Vicky told Alexander Knox what had happened in her apartment. Knox brought her into a microfilm room. I think your friend Bruce is pretty messed up, Vicky. They sat down in front of a microfilm reader and Knox pulled up a headline that read, Thomas Wayne murdered, prominent doctor, wife slain in robbery, unidentified gunman leaves child unharmed. Bruce's parents. The poor kid watched the whole thing happen right in front of him. Oh my gosh, his parents were murdered in that alley. That's why he went there. It was the anniversary of their deaths. Look at the photo, the look on his face, it's just like that day with the Joker in front of City Hall. Meanwhile, in the Batcave, Bruce Wayne sat in front of the computer monitors, but not really paying attention to anything. Alfred came up to him with a police file in his hand. The file on your parents, sir, as requested. Thank you, Alfred. I shall be in the kitchen if you need me. 
As Alfred left, Bruce opened the file. He looked at a picture of his parents, Thomas and Martha Wayne. He began to remember that night when he lost them. They had just left the movies and had taken a shortcut through the alley. Out of the darkness came two men. One of them grabbed at Martha's necklace. Thomas tried to stop the man, but the other man had pulled out a gun and shot Thomas. Then, he turned and shot Martha. He pointed his gun at young Bruce. The gunman stepped closer to him. Tell me something, my friend. Have you ever danced with the devil by the pale moonlight? Let's go. Let's go, Jack. The two men disappeared into the night, leaving Bruce all alone in that alley. His whole world shattered. Back in the present, Bruce had realized that the Joker had murdered his parents all those years ago. It was him. Bruce, are you all right? What? How did you get in here? Alfred, is this what you were going to tell me at my apartment when the Joker came? You're him, aren't you? The Batman. I've loved you every night since I met you. I don't know what to think of all this. I really don't. Sometimes I don't know what to think of all this. This is something I have to do. It's not a perfect world. It doesn't have to be a perfect world. I've just got to know if we're going to try to love each other. I'd like to. But he's out there right now. I have to go to work. With that, Bruce left Vicky and headed for the suit vault where his bat suit was waiting. Batman would make his move against the Joker. At Axis Chemicals, two of the Joker's thugs stood guard outside the main gate. They heard a loud engine roar and saw a black sleek vehicle heading straight towards them. The thugs dove for cover as the Batmobile crashed through the gate. Twin machine guns emerged from open flaps of the sleek car and opened fire on the shuttered steel doors. The machine guns retracted and the flaps closed as the Batmobile cruised through the now shattered door. Inside the factory, Joker's goons fired their weapons on the sleek car. Their bullets bounced off of the Batmobile's bodywork. The Batmobile sped past the remaining thugs. Inside, Batman had flipped a switch and the machine guns had once again emerged from the vehicle's front. He fired the guns at the two flammable containers. The containers exploded as Batman drove his car through the flames and back out through the main entrance. Axis Chemicals was now a massive inferno. The Batmobile screeched to a halt as Batman saw a helicopter flying above him. Joker was in that helicopter. Holding a bullhorn, the Joker couldn't help but smile at his adversary. Oh, you figured out where I concocted my little prizes, eh? The place where my life as the Joker started. But you're down there, and I'm up here. <laughs> I'm going to the Gotham Bicentennial Festival. You really ought to show up. It's gonna be a gas. <laughs> the helicopter flew toward the city. If Joker could take the sky, then so could Batman. In Gotham Square, the festival was in full swing. Most of Gotham were there celebrating. Huge balloons populated the parade. In the lead float, that was a large birthday cake, was the Joker. He began throwing hundreds of dollar bills at the crowd. Welcome everyone. Enjoy yourselves. Open those uh, hungry wallets. 
not far away. Vicky and Knox got out of their car and saw the people catching and grabbing the money that the Joker was throwing at them. You think Batman will show for this? He'll be here. Knox looked at one of the balloons and saw something was seeping out of it. Vicky looked through the telephoto lens in her camera and saw that some vapor was coming out of canisters that were attached to the balloon. Those balloons are filled with Smilex gas. He's going to kill everybody. Come on, we've got to warn the crowd. Where's Batman? They heard a loud roar from above and looked up. Both of them saw a jet plane flying overhead. A plane in the shape of a bat. Is that him? Inside the bat wing, Batman contacted Alfred on the radio. Alfred, you read me? Yes, sir. What's up? Most of the crowd hasn't seen the gas or its effects. They're still looking at the bills. On the ground below, the people were still picking up the dollar bills until they discovered that the face on the bill was the Joker's. It was fake money. Joker felt it was time for the party to end and pulled a gas mask and a remote control from his coat pocket. Now comes the part where I relieve you little people of the burden of your failed lives. But as my plastic surgeon always said, when you gotta go, know the smile. <laughs> Joker put on his gas mask and hit the switch on the remote control. Smilex gas started leaking from all the other balloons. Batman banked the bat wing toward Gotham Square. He flipped a switch on his control panel. From under the front of the cockpit, a cable catcher and cutter slid out to protrude in front of the bat wing. Batman guided the bat wing under the balloons. The cable catcher and cutter caught the ropes securing the balloons. He closed the catcher and started to bank the bat wing higher into the air, pulling the balloons away from the city. When he was at a safe distance, Batman flipped another switch, and the cutter blades sliced the ropes, releasing the balloons into the night sky. The bat wing turned and dove back towards the city. The Joker couldn't believe it. Batman had ruined his plan and upstaged him. Joker angrily climbed down the birthday cake float. He stole my balloons. Why didn't anyone tell me he had one of those things? In the confusion, the citizens started running away. In a matter of minutes, Gotham Square was empty. Joker wondered why everyone had dispersed until he heard a loud roar from the sky and saw the bat wing heading straight toward him. Come on, you wing freak. Come to me. <laughs> from the cockpit, Batman saw the Joker standing in the middle of the square. He flipped a switch and twin machine guns emerged from hidden panels on each side of the wings. He took careful aim and fired. Bullets bounced off of the pavement around Joker, missing him, perhaps on purpose. Joker didn't waste any time and pulled a long barrel revolver from his inner coat pocket. He took careful aim and fired at the approaching bat wing. The bullet hit its mark. Vicky stood in horror as she saw the bat wing belly flop onto the street before it crashed onto the steps of Gotham Cathedral and erupted into a ball of flames. Vicky ran toward the wreckage on the cathedral steps. She couldn't really see anything through the flames except twisted metal and the remains of the cockpit. Her heart sank when she felt the cold steel of a pistol pressed against her head. Vicky turned slowly and saw that it was the Joker. 
Looks like I must get you to the church on time. He pulled out a handheld radio from his pocket and radioed his men from the helicopter. Transportation for two at the top of the Gotham City Cathedral in five minutes. <laughs> Roger, boy. Joker looked up at the tall cathedral. They would need a little more time to climb to the top. Better make a ten. Joker motioned Vicky to start heading inside the cathedral. As they entered, Batman pushed the damaged wing off of him and slowly got to his feet. Though he was hurt, there was no time to rest. He started heading inside to find the Joker and Vicky. The church was empty, but Batman figured they were heading up the stairs to the bell tower. Out of exhaustion, he leaned against the church pews and they fell one by one to the ground. On the staircase, Joker heard the commotion below. It was now apparent that Batman survived the crash. He motioned Vicky to keep climbing until they reached a trapdoor set in the ceiling directly above the stairs. Joker and Vicky emerged through the trapdoor and discovered they were in the bell tower. To the right of the door were two huge bells, which must have weighed 50 tons each. The larger of the two bells sat on rocker beds above the staircase. There is nowhere else to run. Why so serious? Joker casually sported one of the holding pins on the large bell with his acid flower. <laughs> The bell broke free and descended from the tower to the staircase. Batman had flattened himself against the wall as the bell plummeted past him, bringing pieces of the staircase with it. The bell crashed to the staircase entrance, completely blocking Commissioner Gordon and his men, who had just arrived at the cathedral. There was no way they could get up to the bell tower. Gordon turned to one of his officers, I want searchlights aimed at the bell tower. See if you can get a police helicopter out here. I'll do what I can, sir, but it may take a while. Batman finally made it to the trapdoor and slowly opened it. There was no sign of the Joker or Vicky. He climbed up and looked around. It seems at last I have a bat in my belfry. <laughs> Suddenly, two of the Joker's thugs jumped out of the shadows. Batman began to battle the thugs, quickly knocking them unconscious. They were no match for him. A third Joker thug emerged from behind the other bell. This one swung a rope with a heavy steel pulley tied to one end at Batman. As Batman ducked, the pulley had just missed him and hit the stone wall behind him. For the first time, he noticed Joker and Vicky were dancing a waltz. Batman had to finish this fight and save Vicky from the Joker's clutches. He kicked the thug in the stomach, which sent him hitting the back of his head against the bell, and he slumped to the floor. All the while, Joker continued his dance with Vicky. It's as though we were made for each other, Vicky. Beauty and the Beast. Of course, if anyone else calls you Beast, I'll end them. Excuse me, have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? Batman hit the Joker in the jaw. You're not gonna walk away from this. You idiot. You made me, remember? You dropped me into that vat of chemicals. That was pretty hard to get over. And don't think that I didn't try. I know you did. The Cape Crusader delivered an uppercut punch, which sent the Joker out onto the balcony. You killed my parents. What? What are you talking about? I made you 
but you made me first. Joker slowly walked backward to the edge of the balcony. Ah, I say you made me, so you have to say I made you. Um, how childish could you get? The villain pulled out a pair of glasses and put them on. You wouldn't hit a guy with glasses, would you? Batman delivered a roundhouse punch that sent the Joker over the edge of the balcony. Both he and Vicky looked down. Suddenly, Joker pulled both of them over the edge and they grabbed onto one of the gargoyles. Joker couldn't help but smile at the sight of Batman and Vicky dangling over 800 feet, holding onto a cracked gargoyle. He began kicking the already cracked structure, and it started to break. I don't make them like they used to. A gust of wind tore at Batman and Vicky. It was the downdraft of Joker's helicopter. A rope ladder popped from the belly of the helicopter and uncoiled down to the Joker. He grabbed the bottom and looked back at Batman and Vicky. Well, it's time to retire. Feel free to drop in. Batman couldn't let Joker get away. Not this time. While still holding onto the gargoyle, he freed one of his hands, reached into his belt and pulled a small grappling gun. He lifted the small gun and squeezed the trigger. A thin metal line shot out and whipped around the Joker's ankles. Batman managed to tie the near end of the line around another gargoyle and secured it. Joker's eyes widened as he saw what Batman had done. But before he yelled up to the helicopter, the gargoyle broke free and hung from the Joker's ankles, like a pendulum. The weight of the gargoyle was too much for Joker, and he let go of the rope ladder. As he fell, the gargoyle collided with the one that Batman and Vicky were holding on to, and all three of them fell. Batman grabbed a hold of Vicky and fired his grappling gun sideways. The grappling hook wrapped around one of the lower gargoyles. Batman and Vicky swung and crashed into one of the cathedral's windows. He took the brunt of the crash, but he had to be sure Vicky wasn't hurt. Are you alright? I think so. I don't think the same can be said for the Joker. On the ground below, laid the Joker, lifeless. His reign of crime was over. The next night, there was a large press conference in front of City Hall. The mayor, Harvey Dent, and Commissioner Gordon stood in front of a crowd full of reporters. Members of the press, we have an announcement to make. Our district attorney, Harvey Dent, is going to read a statement. We received a letter from Batman this morning. Gotham City's earned a rest from crime. But if the forces of evil should rise again to cast a shadow on the heart of the city, call me. Alexander Knox stepped forward with his tape recorder. Question, how do we call him? Gordon walked to the far end of the city hall stairs, where they had rigged up a searchlight. He gave us the signal. He turned it on. The bright beam shone on the side of Gotham Cathedral. A signal that had the emblem of a bat. Knox had noticed Vicky Vale also in the crowd. He walked toward her. Vicky, aren't you covering this press conference? No, I'm gonna disappear for a while. What about the Pulitzer Prize? You get that for me, Allie. Without warning, Vicky gave Knox a kiss. She smiled at him and started walking away. Well, what about your picture with Batman? Take care, Allie. Vicky walked around the corner and noticed Alfred standing there, in front of the family Rolls Royce. 
He opened the rear door for her. I thought champagne might be in order, Isabel. Thank you, Alfred. They both got in and he turned back to her. Mr. Wayne said to tell you he'd be a bit late. <laughs> I'm not a bit surprised. Alfred smiled as he drove the car through the streets of Gotham. High above on one of the roofs, Batman looked at the bat signal. It was as if he was looking at his future in an adventure that was just beginning. <laughs>